Okay, I'll start the webinar. So welcome everyone to this month's uh, VSSC Insights Series. Um, as you know, the Insights Series is a monthly webinar appointment organized by the Data Space Support Center to give a com the, our community a chance to learn everything that the, that the VSSC does, such as events, initiatives, technical policy developments, and of course, uh, are the key technical deliverable uh, delivered by the VSSC. So uh, today's webinar, will be about uh, achieving convergence in data spaces. So in the next slide, we can see the agenda. The, um, the Today's agenda will be um, opened by our colleague Gianfranco Cecconi, which is the executive director for the Data Space Support Center. Then um, the Daniel Alonso, senior technical lead uh, at the Big Data Value Association, and, and Sebastian Steinbus, Chief Technical Officer and at the International Data Space Association will introduce the DSBA Technical Convergence document. And soon after, uh, Jason Fox, Technical Evangelist at Fiverr Foundation, will introduce the Fiverr Data Spaces Connector. Um, I would like to add a, a couple of uh, housekeeping rules for this webinar. The first one is that the, this webinar is recorded. So uh, you will, uh, you, you will, the recording will be available soon after the webinar is done. And then you have the chance to ask questions uh, in the Q&A in the chat, but it, uh, and then our speakers will try to answer the question during the webinar. Whatever question that is left unanswered will be answered at the very end of the webinar in a dedicated 20-minute uh, Q&A session. Now, before leaving the floor to the speaker in the next slide, you can see two key ways to stay up to date with our community. The first one is the newsletter. Uh, the newsletter is, uh, is a, an important way to learn to stay up to date with the Data Space Support Center and the European Union program for common European data space. You can subscribe using the QR code in the slide or the link. And then most importantly, uh, we, have, uh, we are proud to announce our annual event the Data Space Symposium 2024, which will take place uh, from the 12th to the 14th of March at the Darmstadium uh, and uh, in, uh, in Darmstadt in the, in, the, in the area of Frankfurt. And you can pre-register at the link. Uh, so you will be the first to know when the official ticketing and registration um, opens up. So without further ado, I am very proud and happy to leave the floor to our colleague John Franco and to get the webinar started. Thank you, Anna. Uh, good afternoon to all of you with us live and the ones who will be watching uh, the recording later. My name is Gianfranco Cecconi, and together with Anna, I will be your host for today. Uh, in November, I had the privilege to be invited by project coordinator Professor Boris Otto to join the Data Space Support Center as the project executive director. So you, you'll be seeing more of me over the next uh, two years or more. Don't get tired of me, I hope. Um, I'm not new to the project uh, as I come from Capgemini Invent, which is also a partner in the SSC. I'm a veteran of the European data strategy. Uh, before joining the project, I had the opportunity to lead uh, both the European Union Open Data Program, uh, DataEuropa.eu, and also the predecessor project to this one, the Support Center for Data Sharing, that completed in 2022. So I started dedicating my career to data sharing actually more than 10 years ago when I first joined the Open Data Institute in London. And I'm very, very happy to continue the trajectory together with the DSCC and, and with you. Uh, the theme uh, for today's Insight Series webinar is achieving convergence in uh, data spaces. Like for uh, most pieces of technology in history, success is always the result of a combination of two drives. On, on, on one side, it's a bit of a diverging, a creative one, uh, where multiple options are created to address the same challenge and compete for market relevance and the customer's preference. And on the other side, a converging uh, drive uh, in which uh, fewer options emerge and become mainstream. Uh, for the user, the choice can become narrower in that case, but there is also less uncertainty. So the resulting dynamics uh, between uh, these two drives is not always a success story. Even after achieving some kind of convergence, the surviving solutions may be hostile to each other. Perhaps they are compatible and interoperable, but just to some degree. So who is uh, the victim uh, of this fight? Well, the user sometimes is. Let me go back uh, to actually the slides because um, a good example is actually what you see on screen. 
uh, for years, uh, both Apple and Google have extended the messaging standards in mobile phones following different specifications. Uh, the first uh, with what they call iMessage, uh, the second according to the Rich Communication Services specification, so RCS. If you use texting on an iPhone, uh, you probably often see something like in the picture on screen. The messages from other iPhones look beautiful in blue, while the ones uh, from the users of other kinds of phones look green. If they include rich media, like pictures, they look pixelated and static. This got to the point that sociology researchers have been studying how uh, this has created a sort of caste system, particularly among young people, where the green bubbles are associated with the use of uh, less cool Android phones, which are generally cheaper and suggest the person is less wealthy. So iMessage is a proprietary specification of Apple, while RCS is currently developed as a standard by the GSM Association, the organization that brings together about 1,000 mobile operators worldwide and gave us also the uh, 5G standards. However, sometimes reason prevails. And, and a few weeks ago, Apple announced that it will support RCS in future iPhones starting next year. So this is 13 years after iMessage was created. So. Now, data spaces are not yet big as uh, mobile phones. Nonetheless, it is useful that the many organizations engaged in writing the specifications of future data spaces avoid diverging beyond what is necessary to ensure uh, creativity and unhealthy competition for the best ideas. This is the main uh, topic uh, for us today. Even if you've been um, following the development of data spaces for a while, you may still uh, be a little confused about who is doing what. Uh, are there many organizations that strive to develop the technical specification and standards we need uh, working nicely together? Or are they rather plain dirty, trying to beat the others in some kind of race for world domination, right? Our ambition at the SSC for today is that you will have a good answer to that question uh, by the end of this webinar. And a few friends uh, will help us. Uh, First Big Data Value Association, Daniel Alonso, and International Data Space Association, Sebastian Strambus, will describe the work that has been done jointly with GAIAX and the Fiber Foundation over the last two years. Um, and for full disclosure, all four organizations are partners of the Data Spaces Support Center too. They published earlier this year what they call a technical convergence discussion document. In their words, um, the document defines a common reference technology framework based on the technical convergence of existing architectures and models, and it leverages uh, mutual infrastructure implementation efforts. Then we will meet uh, Faber Foundation's Jason Fox, uh, who will describe the foundation's work on the connector software. If you're not new to data spaces, uh, you know that the connector uh, is one of the most common software components in the data space implementation, often accounting for multiple of the technical uh, building blocks that are described in data space support centers uh, uh, blueprint. In short, the connector provides most of the functionality you need as a participant in a data space to connect to the other participants and start exchanging data. So uh, join me in welcoming our guests. Uh, if time allows, we will, we will be available later for your questions and feel also free to use the chat while our guests uh, describe uh, their work. Uh, guys, uh, the floor is yours, Daniel and uh, Sebastian. So thanks a lot, Gianfranco, for the kind introduction. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Daniel Alonso. I am Senior Technical Lead at BDBA. We are partners of the project, as uh, Gianfranco mentioned before, uh, also members of DSBA, as you can see in this slide. And uh, I am personally involved in the one of the expert group in the defining the, the, blue, the blueprint of the project, more specifically the, the, the data value creation. Uh, which is the part that we will focus on today in the webinar, and also I am also part of the technical technical architectural board of the of the of the project. Okay, I don't know, Sebastian, if you want also to introduce yourself because we will be doing the presentation together. So, yes, thank you. So, uh, my name is Sebastian Steinbus, CTO of International Data Spaces Association. Since a while, and uh, I will take my part of the presentation after Danielle has started it. Perfect. So if you go, you can go to the next slide, Gianfranco. Uh, you already more or less presented the SBA uh, and what we are also trying to achieve. Actually, we are contributing to this uh, picture that you mentioned at the beginning to try to, uh, okay, join forces to come up with a, a common framework. We're uh, also achieving this convergence. So uh, BDBA, IDSA, Gaia X, and Fiber join forces back in uh, 2021 in September, so two years ago already. 
And yes, the purpose is, uh, on the one hand, to foster the adoption of data spaces all around Europe and, and beyond, but also to come up with some kind of convergence that can be also used to, 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 uh, to uh, design and build data spaces. So here you can see our main our main mottos, uh, one voice. So we want to to be aligned, also to find synergies and to speak uh, one to uh, same objectives and the same way to how to achieve those objectives. We are also sharing our expertise, uh, so we are leveraging on what the others are doing. So not to reinvent, reinvent anything, but also to to rely on what the others are doing. And also very important, we are bringing together more than 1,000 uh, key industry players uh, all around Europe, all around the world, I would say. And um, from different perspectives, industry, academia, uh, policymaker, research, and, and so on. Also very important, uh, we are also bringing together more than 90 hubs in 34 countries. And we have realized that this is very important because at the, at the end of the day, the hubs uh, provide uh, this capillarity that is needed to reach uh, you know, regional, national ecosystems to uh, raise awareness of the benefits of data sharing, data spaces, also to foster the adoption, and also why not to act as test uh, test uh, facilities for the data spaces, what we are doing also here. So if you can go to the next slide, uh, and also is, uh, it addresses uh, basically what we are going to discuss today. We have included in the slide uh, the uh, 100 days roadmap that the DSBA uh, uh, agreed at the beginning because we think that this is still valid, okay? It is still valid because you can see here that one of the main points of this roadmap is the reference technology framework, where as Gianfranco mentioned before, uh, is basically the idea is to come up with a common reference uh, technology, technology framework, okay? Based on the convergence of what, what we are doing, based on existing uh, architecture, but also uh, also leveraging, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the assets, the resources and infrastructure that each of us are, are, are implementing. So the idea is to come up with a minimal viable framework uh, that incorporates uh, a set of building blocks, okay? Uh, at the beginning, just uh, three pillars that uh, are used to achieve those two aspects that I mentioned in the slide, data interoperability, data sovereignty and trust, and also data value, data value creation. Uh, in the next slide, uh, and one of the main outputs of this, uh, in the next, uh, yeah, one of the main outputs of this activity is uh, what Gianfranco mentioned before, the DSBA technology convergence discussion document. Uh, I would say that it's a very nice achievement because we have been able to to compile a, a nice uh, list of uh, standard reference implementation and so on. So the first version was published in October 2022, uh, sometime uh, last year, but uh, also we have updated uh, the paper this year with the second version published in, in April, okay? Here you have the link to the to the last version of the document, so you can go there and download the paper and, and check uh, and also uh, so be update what we, what we are doing also. And we also have the mandate for our CEOs to keep working on that. So now we are working, started to work in the third version of this paper, okay? We're still defining what the depth and breadth of this paper will be, okay? Uh, how we can uh, update uh, the paper, uh, how we can extend the definition of the building blocks and so on. And, uh, okay, uh, we don't still know how, when this paper will be ready, but, uh, okay, we encourage all of you to be to be tuned because the, the paper will be uh, will be public in the next uh, in the next months. And uh, so this is my introduction. For now, we will go to the to the paper. So we start uh, defining the position of the different uh, of the four uh, organizations in the, in the in the whole picture. Okay, uh, we didn't bring here the picture that is in the paper because somehow it's a bit uh, outdated. Okay, uh, we have uh, also we this is the picture that you, we are um, handling in DSBA to show how the different uh, associations are, are positioned. It is true that we can claim that all of us are more or less covering uh, different blocks, but if we want to define where we are more positioned, uh, this is the this is the this how it looks like. So in the bottom up, you can see Gaia X and IDSA more focused on the part of standardization, so the picture and tools, okay? So different standards and also defining uh, reference and, and so on. In the middle, we have Fiverr uh, uh, implementing uh, open source uh, blocks, capabilities and infrastructure. And on top, in the part of business cases, value, and also data products and application, we can we have BDBA, uh, more in contact with the participants and also the, the service providers. Again, it's very this figure is very simplistic. Uh, of course, uh, all of us are working in different aspects and cross cross boundaries uh, aspect. But if we want to define more or less our main profile, it should be the case. So, um, if you go can go to the next slide, Gianfranco. Um, 
So this is the main, the main, the, the core of the paper. Okay, uh, this is the, the taxonomy of the building blocks, and you probably you recognize this picture because we, uh, in the in 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 principle, we adopted the, the taxonomy from the OpenDIA project. As you know, they produce a, a nice taxonomy of uh, uh, for data spaces combining uh, different perspectives. Here we are bringing just the technical building blocks, the technical pillars. Uh, and we think that this uh, and this picture has been refined in by DSBA again, again renaming some of the building blocks and also changing the scope of some of the building blocks also in the paper. Anyway, the, the, the this taxonomy addresses uh, the, the three pillars that we think are uh, very important for the for the building block. Sorry for the data space. The first one is is trust. Okay, so uh, participants in the data space have to, have to trust each other. So this is why the main, the center pillar of the of the data space is data sovereignty and trust. It will be described later on by, by Sebastian. And on the left side of the picture, we have data interoperability. So participants do not only have to trust each other, but also to understand each other. So we have to define a common language so they can understand each other. So it's key uh, for, for, for this aspect. And finally, in the right side, we have the data value creation. So one of the ultimate objectives of, that, of sharing data in the data space is that all participants uh, generate value out of data sharing in the data space. So these are the three pillars and the different building blocks, and we will explain with more detail uh, during the presentation. But on top of this uh, figure, we have also defined a, a very quite uh, simple uh, systems architecture view, but at the same, at the same time, quite effective because uh, it serves uh, to categorize the different components from different perspectives. For instance, we have the, the view of the data space governance authority that basically focus on the registry and all the part of the trust and uh, trust anchors and so on. Okay, We have also the view of the participant in the space, that the participant, either a provider or a, or a consumer, uh, can use a connector to connect to the data space. And later on, uh, our colleague from Fireware will go deeper on that, but this connector is a control environment where different capabilities are included. Okay, and if you go to the peak, to the view of the of the data space enablers, uh, you, uh, those uh, those guys uh, will provide uh, services that can serve to the operationalization operationalization of the data space. We we have called federated services. And uh, and from this, I will hand over to Sebastian. Probably Sebastian, you want also to comment on this slide because you were much more involved than me in this in this uh, you know system architecture. You will complement what I have said, and you can also continue from there if you want. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, yes, so thanks for, for, for explaining also this figure and this slide and also the provenance of this picture. Um, because, well, this is something that is that is rooted in the start of the, in the, in the beginning of the Data Space Business Alliance. Uh, when you know four parties, and you mentioned they are of a different kind, um, agreed to work on something and to converge to something, then of course we have, have different perspectives and a different view on things. So we needed to align on a starting point and well, that was it. But, so it's not only the nine technical building blocks. We also have uh, in the OpenDI document three governance-related uh, building blocks. Um, but this was our starting point to have something, some common ground where we could agree on and then dig into the details. And well, this is history, uh, and today this is our foundation to work on because this is really the foundation where we understand each other and can discuss on each other, other, and produce good content. So, John Franco, on the next slide. Um, there is uh, another perspective on this thing um, th that we had to agree on because uh, I mentioned and Danielle mentioned we are of a different kind and have a different understanding uh, of what is needed to build a data space. So, of course, you need software on the one hand side. You need a tool um, to, to work with, um, but we have different perspectives. Um, and so this is one of the important uh, figures um, that we have in the, in the architecture coherence document uh, where we agree on our common vision of a data space. Um, maybe you will recognize it. Um, it's pretty similar to what uh, is also done in the data spaces support center work in the, uh, in, the in the DSSC blueprint. So we have somehow the, the same uh, view angle uh, on the thing at hand. And to make it easier for you listening, uh, I marked some important things. So, so on, in the middle on the left, you will find most probably you, because most of you will typically want to join in a data space. Your goal is you want to share data, you want to use data, you want to create value out of data somehow by giving it away or using data from others or mixing, matching, whatever you want to do. Um, so then you're a participant, but this is a role. 
typically. And uh, maybe you're an individual, maybe you're an organization, and maybe you're an organization with multiple individuals or whatever. So, but typically you don't have a, a connector that you can plug in somewhere and uh, download things from the internet. So you need a tool in the end. Um, and we name it here the, the participant agent. That's a tool of choice, your connector then to the data space um, that implements various functionalities that you need to, to share and exchange data in the end, including what is mentioned on the bottom, um, trust and identity management related things like the credentials that you need um, and the identity providers that you need. Um, but the question is, so when we talk about uh, data spaces here, um, because it's a data spaces support center, um, of course, a data space is also here written as a box and you can as a participant be a member of a data space. Well, but well, a data space, that's not a thing in itself. You cannot touch it and you cannot use it as a thing. It's a concept. So it's really like the relation of the multiple participants that you have and how they relate to each other, how they interact with each other. Um, <clears throat> and to do so, to establish such a data space and the relationship between the different participants, you need a kind of a rule set. So and this is the data space governance authority. This must not be an organization. It could be an organization uh, that organizes and runs a data space, but it could be just a set of rules, processes, and responsibilities that you set up in your group. But we have to name this box because it has a certain functionality and responsibility. Um, the authority, may it be a document, an organization, or anything in between or beyond that organizes and manages uh, such a data space. <clears throat> so, and then of course, to do so, to become a member of such a data space. Um, you need something like, uh, so this is typically in our thinking, you need something like a registry, simple member list where you can see all the members that uh, you have in your data space. But well, that's maybe not the final truth um, that you will have a member list, but you need something like a data space registry. Um, but this is basically the proof of participation. May it be your Excel list as member list, uh, or may it be just some, some verifiable credentials that really, um, you claim that you're a member of this data space and you will stick to these rules. So this is important because as I said, we come from different angles and different perspectives. We have the software perspective in here because the data space registry is maybe somehow software related. The participant agent uh, and all the identity systems are definitely software. Um, but the upper part with the data space governance authority. Um, so that's not software that are roles, that are responsibilities. This is about governance, and this is about also business and legal aspects. Now, the, the, those are of different kinds. And so this really helps us to come up with a common picture and to point on the things we are talking about. Um, and of course, uh, so on the next slide, what you will see is um, that we need a purpose. So why do we want to build a data space? Uh, I once had some discussions and uh, Daniel said, well, this is just a, just a tool, just the next piece of software. What what does it do? So what makes it special that it's a data space? Um, and this always makes me think when people ask me, so what is special about this? What is new about a data space? Well, I have a clear answer on that. And this is uh, what is also part of, uh, of our common document, of our common vision. Um, well, that's easy. Of course, the first thing is you want to make data available, shareable, and enable value creation out of this data. And well, it's as easy as that. You want to shift data from a data center A to a data center B, um, mix it, make cool things out of it, whatever, or send the algorithm to the data, whatever you want to do. But this is a major purpose. Um, and this is what we can do already today. We can do it since five years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever you ask for. Um, but we need this on a certain degree of maturity because what we want to have is that the data subject, the data holder, or however you name the one that is responsible for the data in the end, um, has the ability cont to control the usage of the data. Um, so I have to make sure that I can explain, this is my data, and of course you're allowed to use it, but please don't give it away. Or if you give it away, um, then please put a stamp on it that it came from my end. Or if you sell the data, well, then give me 10% of the revenue that you have, or whatever kind of policy you want to have. You want to stay in control of the data, whatever that means. So, and then our goal is to provide a concept, to provide multiple concepts, structures, and all the required means to enable 
the first thing and the second thing under fair conditions. So under equal conditions that uh, we have small, mid-sized companies that can really interact also with larger companies. You want to provide a fair playground. And this is what is put in the in the uh, figure below. So I, as a data subject, as a data holder, want to achieve some means that my data can be used, can be shared, but I still have some degree of control about the data. So this is basically, for me, the important things that we had to do in the beginning to strive for this coherence. Um, and what we will not do today is to go into each and every nitty little uh, standard and explain exactly how we define a DIT document. And I know that you're interested in, but those who are, you can read the document. Um, but let us go a little bit uh, into the boxes um, that we have. So on the next slide, we have um, the first pillar about uh, data interoperability. Um, and we have our three boxes inside the data models and formats. We need a data exchange API, and we want to do some provenance and traceability uh, on the data in the end. And so this is what, what we describe in the re remainder of the document here. So how we fill those different building blocks with life. So with the data models and formats, how data models and formats can be of help and can be used in data spaces. Well, it's not that we have the lingua franca that for each and every domain, we have a semantic data model for each and every use case. No, that is not what we are proposing from the DSPA. But we want to make sure that a data space will set up the required means so that data are interoperable. You can understand what kind of data is provided, what kind of data will be sent to you, and how you can use it in the end. And therefore, you need some structural capabilities to make use of, for example, semantic data models um, or other data models that you use to understand uh, the data in the end. And of course, we have the great fireware smart data models are also linked inside, which is a real great asset where you can find data models that you can reuse in your domain. It's not one, it's not two, it's something like 400 and a little, if I remember correctly, but maybe Jason will say, Sebastian, you're wrong, it's 600, 700, whatever it is, but it's really a rich library where you can start from. Uh, so you don't have to start from scratch, you can reuse what is already there, which is an important aspect. Second pillar, uh, the data exchange APIs. Uh, so this is, uh, no, back on the other slide. <clears throat> no worries. Um, so what we will also not do is we will not provide all the APIs that are required for each and every business data that you have. You would tend to do some streaming data or you have message oriented things. You have big data, you have small data, you have high frequency data, whatever you have. Um, and of course we could do cool things and invent something for everything, but that's not the purpose here. So the purpose is, <clears throat> this is what we clearly describe, is that if we want to conduct a data exchange, data sharing uh, in a data space, we have to distinguish those two phases. The control phase, where we talk about uh, the identification, the catalog, the discovery of data, um, and the negotiation of contracts. So how are you allowed to use the data? And then how can we can agree and set up a data the tangible data exchange API to conduct the data exchange, the data sharing in the end. And therefore we provide different means. So we have the data space protocol on the one hand side, supporting the control phase. So all the uh, interoperability required things to, to control the data exchange. Um, and then, practical things to conduct the data exchange, like we have NGSI, NGSI uh, as a great standard to then really conduct the actual data transfer and make use of data or do something else uh, beyond NGSI. So, and the final pillar is about provenance uh, and traceability. So this is where we talk about how can we create uh, measures to make data transaction observable in both directions. So because what you want to do is not only exchange data from one person to another, maybe you do something cool with the data, combine and combine it with the next data, do some great analytics, give it away, bub, bub, bub. But then as a data, the original data holder, I want to know what happened to my data. I want to trace the data. What happened were all the policies that I've put uh, on the data being uh, implemented. And also the other direction. If I'm the user of the data, I want to look backwards. Where did the data come from? If you're building an AI model, for example, you are going to ask where did the data come from? How was it generated? What was the quality and so on and so forth. So fundamental measures to do such thing. And if you dig into this box, you will realize, oh, we have to think about data models and formats. We have to think about data exchange APIs and all the things that come in the pillars beyond. Um, so, but now on the next slide, and I think I have to speed up a little to give also Danielle again the floor. Um, we have basically the, the trust and data sovereignty aspects. Um, so I start on the bottom. So with the trust service and, and the identity management, answering the simple questions, who are you? 
and who is everyone else in this data space here? And then how can I trust you? Because you claim that you're a person, you have some certain credentials. Um, and how can I validate this, if this is really the truth or not? So what we do here is we build on a decentralized structures, decentralized identifiers, verifi verifiable credentials and their presentations. And you can read all the details in a couple of pages in the document, how we exactly do this. Um, what is also important and what I would like to mention here is uh, that this uh, uh, box on assessment usage policy control, this is really an important big one because this is the expression of, of data sovereignty, how you're in control of the data. Because the first thing to do to stay in control of the data, you have to explain the others what they are allowed to do and what not. And so you need a foundation for that to just to just express this is what you're allowed to do and what not. And this is what we describe here. We make uh, use ODRL as an interoperable language to make these policies negotiatable. We make it clear, we make it understandable uh, for everyone. So that is clear. If I share my data, those are the conditions and I'm assured that you at least understood it. The second question is then, how will you implement it? How you, will you enforce this? And there are different means and mechanics available how to enforce such policies in the end. Your organizational measures, legal measures, or cool technology related measures. Um, but I think this would be worth another webinar to dig into this topic. So this would be my short part about the first two pillars. Uh, and I think I can hand back to Danielle about the question, well, how can I create value then out of the data? Thank you, Sebastian. So thanks a lot, Jess, because uh, as I explained before, I think we think that one of the ultimate objectives of sharing data is to, to create value out of, the, uh, out of this activity. And the first step in the in the process of value creation is to describe properly the, the data. And it, even though it might seem uh, an easy task, more and more is uh, is becoming more com more complex because if you we take the general case or assumption that the provider does not know in advance who is going to use the data and for what and what for okay so we can imagine that the, the more information we include in the description the better okay so the more exhaustive we are the better more and more now that we on top of the test spaces there are a myriad of application AI application generative AI and so on using data so we don't know what these data are going to use for. So again, the more information we include, the better, uh, not only about the uh, description of the data, but also provenance of the data, uh, lineage of the data, quality of the data also becoming very, very important and, and so on. So this is the first uh, this is the first point. Also, the second point is that the, 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 the provider has to be in control of the, of, the, of the description. So they shouldn't be changed in the process unless there is uh, any kind of error or any kind of uh, of, uh, of problem with the data. So uh, providers, again, has to be in, in control of the descriptions. And uh, the, the language for self description should be technology agnostic. So it's, it can be applied to different uh, platforms or, or structures. In the paper, we propose uh, DCAT, uh, data catalog vocabulary, as the main uh, one of the, the most relevant options to, to describe uh, metadata of, of data. But also uh, in the different versions, uh, DCAT uh, version 2, version 3, but also DCAT AP. Uh, but now the question that arises is uh, to what extent the cat is is valid also to to describe more complex uh, let's say data products including also services resources also other descriptions okay so probably extensions from the cat will be needed uh, also there are already some extensions available for specific sectors but now a matter of discussion here again is to, to what extent the cat uh, will remain also valid for for more let's say complex uh, uh, assets in the data space of course, uh, we also propose data connector as a way to create and maintain self uh, descriptions. Uh, and probably uh, later on, a uh, colleague from Firewall will go deeper into, into the connector. So in the next slide, Gianfranco, uh, we can, okay, I will I will go quickly with that because again, uh, the description should include, uh, among others, uh, those aspects that I mentioned here. But again, the, mo the more information we include, the better. Also, we have to consider in the description if uh, what uh, entities or war, what uh, assets of the data space we want to describe, the, the data products, the offerings. Also, we can also describe, uh, for instance, the identity uh, credentials of the of the people. We can also describe uh, something about the, the evidences of the provenance, as Sebastian mentioned before. So again, the uh, description affects uh, many, many aspects in the data space because at the end of the day, data are everywhere. Also, what information should we should we include in the description? As I mentioned before, the more the better. But of course, it depends very much on the applications, and somehow it should be kind of a dynamic uh, process. 
And also, as I mentioned here, how to link with other elements in the space, for instance, uh, policies, uh, data models, um, and so on. So this, this is the first step uh, to create value, to describe properly what we are going to share. Uh, the next step is, uh, Gianfranco, the next slide is, yeah, the next slide is to, to publish, to make uh, our data products uh, available and discoverable by, by, by others, okay? So uh, here we are, we have also to, to get into account that uh, the, this can depend also of the architecture of the data space, depending on we are addressing a centralized approach, distributed to completely decentralized, so it, it will condition also the how we implement the publication and discovery. Anyway, here we want to manage description and publish them in a catalog and making them available for other participants and, and to discover, okay? In principle, we can use the connector, okay? So each data provider can use each, each own connector to, to, to uh, implement the catalog and include there the description of, the, of its uh, data products. And uh, we propose to, okay, to this connector to be accessible via endpoints by TM4 APIs or, or the or the, connect, or the protocol from, from IDSA, okay? But if we go to a more general case and assumption with the, the provider uh, may want to announce or to, to publish the, the data product in a, at a remote component of the space, uh, instead of the connector, here we are addressing a more, let's say, complex challenge. And we propose in this case to rely on the metadata broker, okay? So the data provider can send the description to the metadata to the to the broker, and in this case the broker will be in charge of uh, publishing the, the information and also to 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 run all the searching and, and public publication uh, aspect. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, the metadata broker can be based on the IDSA uh, specification. They are pretty pretty exhaustive. Also, a metadata broker can be uh, just one meta broker for the whole data space, or we can also uh, rely on distributed brokers. In this case, they have to be synchronized somehow. And again, here the the, cost, the consumer can search, filter, negotiate, and interact with the with the service through the through the metadata broker. Okay. So once we have this the product described and published, we go on to the last part of the of the of the value creation, which is and Franco, the next slide. Which is uh, to put in contact the provider and the and the and the user or the or the or the client through the marketplace. So it's true that the marketplace is not the only way to generate value out of uh, sharing data in the data space, but uh, this is one of the most straightforward uh, ways uh, to generate value. And again, this is the first time. Well, this yeah, it's the first time that the the uh, the providers will enter into contact with uh, with the potential uh, potential customers. Um, here we are considering the paper, the DOM approach, okay? Uh, we are not saying that this is the only way to implement marketplaces, but it is true that DOM is flexible enough to accommodate different uh, different configurations, okay? So as you can see here in, this, in the picture, uh, the DOM relies in a, in a central catalog where, again, different type of services can be, can be, can be published. So here you can have uh, services to access data, services to process data, but also cloud and edge uh, infrastructure services to, to, to process data. It's true that uh, this, uh, this uh, configuration, configuration also allows different types of, of providers. So you can see here the providers of the cloud and edge in a infrastructure as a service uh, perspective, but you can, we can also have uh, providers that are linked with specific platforms, uh, a specific platform, for instance, for a specific context, but also a platform for, for, for a specific, a specific domains. And also, uh, this is the catalog, but also uh, on top of this catalog, we can also have marketplaces, so different marketplaces that can access to these products and that can only announce those products that they want to announce. Also, the marketplaces can be uh, linked to specific uh, providers, as you can see in the picture, but also can be also independent, independent market marketplaces. And of course, some customers can also uh, access the catalog uh, directly to the interface of the of the DOM catalog and not relying in any in any specific marketplace. So again, uh, this uh, this approach is uh, is flexible because it allows us to to okay to play with different components. And you know that now DOM is, is has become a, a project uh, coordinated by engineering, also where fiber is involved. But again, we think that the whole picture uh, makes uh, a lot of uh, you know a lot of opportunities to 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 in, to, to define marketplaces. And here, of course, also this this uh, distribution also con conditions the different roles that will run in the in the in the marketplace. So, service providers, federated marketplaces, customers, operators of infrastructure, and also third third parties. 
Uh, another important component, if you go to the next slide, Gianfranco, is the how we store uh, all the transactions, and this is also connected with, uh, with what Sebastian was mentioning before, provenance and, and traceability. Uh, I will not go into detail because uh, it, this this aspect deserves a lot of uh, a lot of um, a lot of work. But in this case, we are uh, proposing uh, to rely on what so called distributed persistent layer. Okay. With manage uh, and storage of this information, okay, the catalog, uh, the orders, and also information about uh, the usage of the of the products, okay. Uh, this uh, scheme can be implemented on top of uh, existing uh, blockchain uh, entities in Europe and also a national level, and also uh, we propose to use this uh, layer also uh, by the different TM forum APIs. That can be able to to instantiate all the access to the not to only to the marketplace but also to this uh, persistent layer. Uh, so this is about value creation. But if you go to the next slide, uh, Gianfranco, as I was mentioning before, uh, it's not only about marketplaces. Marketplace is just one way of generating value. But now we, uh, but also value creation can go beyond marketplace functionalities that basically offers searching, funding. Uh, access uh, order and so on, and we can also propose uh, interoperation between uh, partners, data fusion, and also additional generation of value uh, uh, by sharing data. Also, very more and more data, as I mentioned before, are used for uh, for AI models and applications. So we have also to consider to what extent we link also uh, value creation to AI uh, communities. And also, we have realized, of course, that this is very much dependent on sector and business, so uh, and business models. So just uh, to generate value, we have also to consider uh, other, not technical building blocks in the data space to connect with the, the business and models and, and so on. So for us, uh, for DSBA, but also for BDBA in particular, this is a very, very important topic, value creation out of data spaces. And now we are working on how to best uh, instantiate it in the, in the paper, okay? Not to extend very much the scope, but at least to consider, yeah, uh, other types of data value creation. And with that, I finish. I will hand over to Sebastian to, to close uh, with some remarks. Sebastian, so you can go to the next slide. And, and also, because as I mentioned before, we are working on the new version of the paper. And you included here some points to, to highlight uh, about that. Yes, and I'm also uh, heavily commenting in the chat and the Q&A session. So it's great that you have so many questions already. And uh, I love to discuss with you. Man, I would love to be in a room again. And so, but we will have this later in Darmstadt. So meet us, let's have a coffee and discuss. So, but closing uh, what, what Danielle and uh, partly I presented. So yes, we are not there yet. Um, and this is something also that I hear from the chat and from the questions. There are so many good questions um, where we don't have a final answer on. Um, maybe one that I can take directly here online. Um, if you ask me, of course, each data exchange should be secured at least with, at least with SSL or better TLS. Um, but there might be a good reason. So that's a point for a coffee. So we are not there yet. Uh, we will work on the version three. Um, and what is important is uh, that we align the work of the the SBA, the Data Spaces Support Center. Um, both of us have real great insights. And of course, we work together and seek also a coherence and alignment uh, between the different things that we have. Coming back to the chat. Now, the data intermediary was a thing that was discussed. No, the DSBA doesn't know about data intermediaries. But of course, we have to. Uh, and we will. And we are going to discuss on this. So um, please bear with us here so we are only humans and work with the best speed that we have. And we will improve. Um, so valid points. We do not ignore it. We just didn't do it yet. And therefore, we work on version three of the document. Um, it will be released in 2024. Um, and this will be great. It will be even better than the one that we have. And it will not be the final one, I'm afraid. This will be a journey that we will have. So I would close with that. Uh, thanks. And I will get back to the chat and continue discussing with you while listening to, to Jason, I think. Very good. Uh... Jason, uh, a lot of content. Uh, I believe the timing is just right. So uh, please uh, take it away. And thanks to Sebastian and Daniel. Firstly, can you hear me uh, clearly? Hi, uh, Jason Fox here. Um, so far, we've been uh, taking the um, 10,000 10, foot view where we've got the, the overall. This is where we get down to what developers actually want, what developers actually do, trying to uh, move from these words to something which you can actually use. Could you get to the next slide, please? So um, the so-called Fireware Data Space Connector um, 
is a open source uh, uh, suite of uh, uh, components. You can see about 20 little boxes on the, on the right hand side. Now, each data space requires a mixture of these uh, uh, these different boxes. So if you're doing, say, uh, um, um, provenance, let's say, you'll need some logging services. OK, you'll need a logging service. It's a role. It's not a specific bit of uh, um, uh, software, but you'll need something which which uses that. Similarly, you'll need security, and that's what the green is basically. It's uh, um, uh, you see, which is going to be your uh, uh, your PIP, PIP, PDP, and what and what have you. And the idea here is that we've got version two of that uh, um, convergence document, and this is an implementation of that version two. But as Sebastian pointed out, version three is in progress. So typical developer sort of thing, you've got changing requirements. As we work out what does work, what doesn't work, we can say, OK, we'll need to uh, uh, alter that or, or whatever. Important point here, though, is that uh, uh, the whole uh, um, system is based around the um, convergent document and the glossary so that we've got well-defined terms as to what is what. So we're using uh, the, the uh, um, existing, we're building on the existing work to come out with something concrete. Next slide, please. So um, what this means is that um, acronym soup. We need to uh, make sure that anything we are creating is based on preferably open standards. So you will find that there are uh, elements like, uh, say, um, DID, uh, decentralized identifiers, which have been specified by uh, W3C, which means you can use that for your verified verified credentials. Again, W3C. And then you've got things like uh, self-issued open ID uh, uh, providers or uh, um, open ID for verifiable credentials. All of these uh, uh, <coughs> specifications available online, you can look at it and you want to get something which will follow that. If you're going to do uh, something where you want to uh, indelibly make a record in blood, then it's obviously going to be the case that you want to be using some sort of blockchain. So again, we'll be following the uh, specifications from EBSI, European Blockchain. Similarly, if you're uh, going to allow certain amounts of information through, then you'll want to be uh, um, making sure you're using whatever the basic standards are for uh, um, uh, access control. And in this in this case, you know, OAuth two, you've, you've I'm sure you've heard of if you're a developer, um, you use your standard P star P architecture. You allow things in now. The addition point here is for uh, uh, marketing, as was mentioned earlier, there is this the um, uh, TM forum APIs. Now, you will find that depending on how you set up your data space, you may or may not need literally all of these blocks on the right hand side, but you will probably need most of them and you will probably need an implementation of most of them. Next slide, please. So actually, what this is, is it's not actually a monolithic data connector. Those don't exist. No, what it is, is it's a uh, a series of uh, components in, uh, in inside a Helm chart. Because if you're going to be uh, applying uh, um, uh, DevOps, you want to be able to spin these things, spin these things up uh, nice and easily. So it's just an app of apps pattern, which can be implemented by Argo CD and various other uh, other things as, uh, as well. So what will happen is that you'll need to configure the uh, various components. And when, when you press your button, all the various uh, uh, elements spin up and it's scalable and it's usable and uh, so on and so forth. Next slide. There are already sample deployments of the uh, the various uh, uh, configuration as code. So you, you need to make sure you could use this as the basis for setting up your, uh, um, uh, your, your, your data space. Obviously, standard configuration of code, you will need to modify the, uh, the various uh, uh, settings, but you will have, for example, APEP, which will have its configuration in there. It will use the uh, the, the uh, various uh, points. Now, if, for example, you don't like one of our implementation or one of our current choices, that's not a problem. This is you know, just plain uh, uh, plain Helm. 
so you can actually uh, um, say take something out replace replace it with a, 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 a another function uh, as as necessary as I said it's all archetypical roles but the really fundamental part here is that the way they are communicating and what they're talking about is done using the standardization and also follows the entirety of the uh, documentation which is uh, uh, on the uh, um, conversion document now I should point out as I think Sebastian pointed out this is work in progress not all of these components are fully available yet not all of these components are necessarily version one even it because obviously we are maintaining this and going forward for uh, um, trying to put in the uh, the various um, uh, elements so for example the um, the DCAT AP uh, interface that the orange bo box in the bottom right isn't there yet fine you know we're we're, we're working on it but the uh, there are already uh, nascent existing uh, um, uh, data spaces which are using these components giving us feedback working out wh where we need to change it when where we need to go forward because it's not just a case of saying right here you go it's a matter of actually getting constant feedback as we uh, um, uh, as as we go forward so why don't we find out what we've got in the box next slide please so what components do you get well this is an interesting point isn't it is it a data space connector or a series of data space components i prefer to call it data space components but at the moment it's called a data space connector so uh if we go to the next yeah, nod there and ne ne next slide uh, various uh, elements you will almost certainly need you'll need some sort of verification service for your verifiable verifiable uh, credentials again if you look at the uh, uh um w3c specification specification around there someone's got to say yes or no now the way it works is that you check is this valid is it uh, still current and then you uh, pass back a, a jwt which may, again can be verified to work out that uh, yet yeah, it's not been tampered with it when it's uh, passed uh, uh, further further on uh, down the list uh, as you would expect it's got the uh, the the uh, um, sci uh, psyop endpoints what have you to uh, put there we've got um uh some sort of uh support for uh, ebsi slowly get slowly getting in there we're working on both uh a uh, human to machine and machine to machine uh, um, uh, uh, in, in, in interactions so you can uh, somehow set up the uh, um, uh, ver verification service so that it can be used i'll be going through the uh, definition of the uh, the flows uh, the flows later on but i'm just going through the uh, the elements in all these cases you can see that there's a uh, uh, a uh, uh, github repository all this is free open source software uh, which uh, you can use to uh, uh, build up uh, your your system. In, not in all cases are we necessarily building up everything directly from scratch. We're obviously um, contributing to existing strong open source initiatives, so that um, uh, there's no again people keep saying the same thing. There's no point in reinventing the wheel. There's no point in coming up with your own uh, API if one's already out there. There's no point in starting from scratch if there's already an initiative for uh, for going forward. But in uh, you need to have an implementation. And when an implementation is not a, a already of a mature level, we'll come up with some software. Please come and contribute. It's open source. Next uh, uh, slide, please. So again, you will need uh, your uh, um, uh, uh, credentials uh, uh, conf uh, configuration service so that you can actually uh, um, communicate with communicate with a wallet. So we need some sort of information here. It needs to uh, uh, handle um, uh, more more scope with the uh, um, uh, EBC token endpoint. It's getting there. You can see how uh, the flow here is going. Uh, to the verifier which actually is checking uh, yeah is, is this is this guy, guy guy legit have they got the uh are they on the uh, um uh, trusted issuers uh, um uh, ser ser service and what have you before it goes through to the standard uh, standard OAuth. so one of them is actually setting yourself up and the other one is actually saying hey i've got a credential or rather i've got a presentation of credentials uh can i actually am i actually uh, allowed allowed in here you can see that this is uh, moving forward next slide um for the actual uh um 
the creation of a verifiable credential, it's uh, a plug into uh, Keycloak. Uh, it's extending the, the popular uh, um, Keycloak uh, uh, Key IDM. Potentially there could be other uh, um, issues uh, of verifiable credentials out there. But again, we're not gonna make our own, uh, our own thing. You've got a standard uh, looking uh, um, uh, um, uh, look, and look, and look and feel of the Keycloak IDM, just another button on it. And it will come up and give you a uh, something which is uh, nicely uh, um, uh, uh, scan scannable. We're in the uh, process of actually just passing it directly over, over to Keycloak. At the moment, the uh, implementation is again under fireware. It's still work in progress. Next slide. So um, we have multiple different ways of uh, trying to ensure that you're either permitted or denied when you are doing your uh, presentations we've got uh, uh one which is based on uh iShare which is from the uh, a, 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 a previous project we've also got uh, uh a, a pep plugin which is based on the dsba pdp um now um and also if you're in a situation where you need to um pass information through in, uh, an, uh, a fireware NGSI subscription to somewhere else, you might need to attach some sort of uh, um, credentials so that it'll physically pass through your uh, uh, connector. That's what your uh, your, your sidecar uh, proxy is. This is uh, uh, these are all extensions to the popular Kong uh, um, application. So again, write as write as little code as possible based on the uh, on the uh, the work the work of others, and you can get all three in a, a single uh, uh, Docker image. Obviously, going back to the uh, previous slides, all on Kubernetes, it's all containerized. It's all there. there. There's been uh, various various updates. Once again, we, this could be extended to be uh, offering additional PDP should this uh, uh, prove prove necessary. Next slide. Um, there, uh, according to DSBA, uh, uh, big documents, this is again going back to convergence document, there needs to be a certain definition of uh, the uh, policy decision point. And we also need to have, uh, we've discovered we need to have various extensions to uh, be able to support the marketing interface of the TM forum API. So uh, once again, there needs to be some sort of policy decision point which either allows you in or not not in and obviously it will depend on how the rules are, are put in uh, in in the first place now if you uh, look at the uh, verifiable credential documentation uh, it's actually if anything slightly over specified so there are multiple competing things out there so it'd be possible to uh, um, if necessary extend it to this flavor that flavor uh, and so on and so forth next slide um there uh, um, are when you're in a situation where you need to be uh, dealing with um, uh, monetization of your data, you need to have a certain uh, you need to have the ability to set up uh, various con uh, uh, contracts and uh, if necessary, set up verifiable uh, uh, cr uh, credentials based on who's in your data space, who you are you allowed to do uh, uh, stuff with. Now, not every data space will necessarily require all of this uh, um, uh, this information, but it's been uh, um, discovered that yeah, we re re uh, we really should uh, put this in so that the uh, the data space potentially can support a wider range of scenarios. Once again, it's not something where we found uh, existing uh, uh, stuff out there, so this is uh, uh, being built against the latest version of the. Uh, TM Forum APIs because they've changed their specification. It's version 10 now. Uh, uh, so making sure that it's actually uh, up, up, uh, up to date and able to go forward. Once uh, we've gone through this little list, we'll go, I'll go through a few, uh, a few flows just to uh, uh, explain what I'm, uh, I'm on about. Next slide. Uh, now, obviously, this is a big one. Uh, when you physically want to get into that nightclub, you need to flash up your ID card saying, yes, I'm a VIP, let me through. Now, the equivalent for verifiable uh, credentials is a scannable wallet. Um, and at the moment, this is a very simple implementation of the wallet, just so that it can hold a, uh, um, a, uh, um, 
uh, sing single credentials to see how it will work. It, I would assume that there will be multiple wallet implementations out there when uh, this technology is, is more more uh, mature, but you need to get something to get started so you can uh, get a, get a, uh, a challenge. You, uh, you scan your QR code and they say, yeah, fine, this, this is what I'm sending uh, Send, sending down 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 the line now obviously um it needs to be integrated with the various uh, services gyrex uh, clearinghouse for example is a, a, a good good uh, uh, a good example and of course it's only going to be really valid for human to machine flows because uh well uh, because the if you've got the machine to machine flow you'll have uh, pre-set up various different things uh, um, uh, bef uh, uh, beforehand next slide um, yeah, you really need to make sure that there are only certain uh, people who can do certain things. Uh, and when you're coming with an in incoming uh, um, uh, verifiable uh, credential, you need to say, do I trust this guy? I mean, the whole point about this data spaces stuff is, frankly, I don't trust anybody, right? Unless I can prove, I'm seeing someone smiling there, unless I can prove otherwise. I always consider this to be very much like... Uh, you know, a bunch of gangsters who really don't trust each other on a Mexican standoff and should say, no, really, I am. I am legit. Really do let let me in. And this means that if you have uh, a blockchain based uh, um, uh, stuff, you can work out, OK, am I allowed to do this? And so on and so forth. You can see all of these various components coming in uh, as 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 uh, as necessary. Next slide. Uh, and of course, you need a registry as well. Because there's no because you need to uh, be able to uh, um, uh, find out who is a trusted participant, who is uh, 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 going forward, and it, of course, it will not necessarily have the information itself. That information will be provided by a trusted a, a trusted issuer's registry, and that in turn will be uh, based on the governance side of things. Now. Uh, this is where, again, going back to what uh, uh, Daniel and uh, Sebastian were saying, that's where Fireware is weakest. We don't do governance directly, but we need to make sure that when we get the information coming in, that it is of uh, about uh, um, participants who are actually part of the data space. So if you've got questions on that, ask the other guys on the list. Uh, OK, um, uh, next slide. So I've mentioned about 20 different uh, um, uh, components. Now, the important point here is that actually you never get these things happening uh, directly where you where you as a an actor um, actually connect to these components. No, the whole point about a data space uh, connector is that it covers the details of this uh, uh, end to end much uh, it hides hides much of it from you because it's standardized it's always the same flow and at some point when it succeeds or fails it will tell you uh, what to do next so there are about four or five different flows which need to be followed here and we'll go i'll go through uh, uh, some of these in a little bit more detail next slide so yeah when oh you've gone backwards again uh so yeah you are a um uh, a le legal representative you're some some person at the uh, organization you really need to make sure that you are, your organization is part of a data space of data space com uh, uh, com uh, uh, coming coming together so um something like gyrex which is the uh, 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 gyrex digital clearinghouse the gx gxdch terrible acronym um will um mean that you can onboard to them uh, and they will issue you some sort of verifiable uh, ver verifiable uh, uh, credential which will be stored in my wallet okay so i've got something in my wallet uh, at that point i now need to actually onboard into my uh, um uh, the uh, da data space itself and they'll say yeah who the hell are you uh, but the uh, uh, important point there is that it will then uh, retrieve the uh, uh, information from uh, from the from the wallet uh, wallet using as you'd expect um um sci -up, sci -up to and verify it make sure that this is actually on the li on the list make sure that this is actually uh, on the uh, um uh, uh, been issued by a a, a trusted a uh, a trusted issuer and uh, eventually it will uh, um 
uh, yeah, uh, go to the um, uh, uh, PFP uh, to work out, um, you know, is this guy, is, is this guy legit? And this is just onboarding you. Uh, eventually what will happen is that, um, uh, check that the, the verifier will check that you've got the, the uh, proper EIDA certificates properly been uh, uh, put through and it will give you the access token. Now this is, uh, something which is necessary as a registration step for any uh, um, uh, system. There is more details about these particular flows uh, directly on the documentation of the uh, um, data space connector. So ne next slide. Similarly, if you want to take part, now that you've got this uh, li 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 little, ac little access token, you need to go through another rather complex flow before eventually it will let you in to the, in, in, uh, in my case, Fireware, it will be some sort of context broker. Uh, so this is where you will need to do the uh, uh, scanning of the QR code uh, in a, uh, uh, of, of, of the wallet. It will uh, say, oi, who the hell are you? And then at some point you'll be, you'll, uh, um, be able to uh, um, check that, yeah, was this verifiable credential actually created by a legitimate authority? Uh, can I give you a token so that you can then gain access to the uh, uh, APIs which will uh, uh, allow you to gain an offering? Uh, having done that, next slide. Actually, no, I'll, I'll skip this one. I'll go to the next slide because I'm going to run out of time. Uh, having done that, you uh, sorry, that. Uh, yeah, you've, uh, you've gained access to uh, some sort of in interaction. This is where your humans come in and they need to uh, um, uh, use the uh, the uh, um, verifiable credential from the role to actually say, yes, I can get in and, uh, and do stuff. So um, once again, it's a case of uh, um, and is it when when you go through the ver verify it's saying uh, is this uh, uh, a participant have they got the credentials which have been done by the uh, the various uh, um, uh, parties are they still a participant because obviously uh, you've got a revocation list which is again going to be based on a uh, an unchangeable uh, uh, system have they got the rights to get in there eventually it will come through to some sort of PEP which will either, which policy execution point which will let you in or rather it will say I'll log that because I might need to pay for it and then it will let you in and of course potentially at some point this will uh, um, let you th this will allow you to uh, uh, come through the system uh, end to end final flow which I'm doing just to uh, uh, give this as an example final slide next slide uh, you can do the same. Oh, no, you've done too many. Uh, uh, you can do a machine to machine interaction. The difference here, of course, is that machines are not very good at, about getting their mobile phone out and scanning a, uh, uh, a QR code. So you need to uh, make sure that you've got the uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the token set up beforehand before you get the uh, 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 get the uh, um, uh, interaction. Once again, this goes back back to what uh, Daniel was pointing out, saying that um, you want to be able to offer the data to say uh, at a, a AI or uh, machine learning on a broad front. So that was very quick. Last slide, and this is where I find out what questions I haven't answered or anyone else haven't answered. So uh, I'll, I'll I'll pass pass back to uh, 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 the uh, the chairman for today. Thank you, Jason. Uh, thank you, Sebastian and Daniel and Gianfranco for for this this great uh, for this great discussion. Uh, I've seen that uh, there's many. The, the chat is very alive. Many questions have been answered in the chat. Um, I take this um, this occasion to highlight that the slides will be made available pretty soon, uh, hopefully or next week. So you can stay tuned uh, to uh, our page. There are uh, a few open questions in the Q&A session. And I think that uh, one is um, from, there's a few from Const Const Constantinus. Uh, one is the issues mentioned regarding the DSSC that is currently presented. Is it supposed to be utilized in multiple roles, such as consumer, producers? Uh, who would like to take this question? 
I believe that came during uh, Jason's presentation. The so, Jason presentation. Uh, uh, outside of context, a bit difficult to, to understand. Sorry, sorry, yes. No, no, it's fine. It, which slide exactly it was related to? I asked already Constantinus yeah. in chat. Uh, Sebastian, I volunteers to take it. <laughs> yes, I, I discussed a little bit with Constantinus uh, in parallel. So so this question is related to, to the next beast in town. Um, it's a Fireware True Connector. So just the next data space connector uh, that we have. So there is. A list of them and multiple of them. So I would propose, even while it's a fiber related connector, I doubt that Jason is an expert on the true connector. Um, so maybe let's take this question offline um, and, and please contact me for that one so that we can, can resolve your issues because this is really highly implementation specific um, and partly related to our work. But Jason, if you would like to add, I don't want to interfere here. Um, the True Connector is one of the components which is in the Fireware catalog for connecting to uh, via, well, connecting to disparate machines basically via um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, IDSA connect, uh, uh, protocol, isn't it? So uh, it's uh, um, something which I've not used, but I'm aware of. So I think you probably want you more than me for that, that, uh, that answer. So thank you, Jason. Um, there's another question in the chat from Leah that just wrote to us and said, I was told that all technological developments for data spaces will be gathered in the Eclipse Data Spaces Foundation. Is that right? Well, that's <laughs> for Sebastian, yeah. I guess yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I volunteer again. So uh, Leah, first of all, glad to see you again. A long time no see. Um, so. So uh, to answer this one, so I don't know if there is something like an Eclipse Data Space Foundation. Um, so that would be something new. Um, there is the Eclipse Foundation and the Eclipse Foundation is uh, working on uh, on open source projects. So they are governing open source project and they provide a good governance uh, to, to run your open source project. And what is true um, is that uh, we founded a new data space working group inside the Eclipse Foundation. So using the governance scheme of the Eclipse Foundation uh, to support the development of certain open source projects. So sorry to say it like this, Fireware is uh, one of a kind and there are other developers uh, of, uh, of data space components. And the Eclipse Data Space Working Group is taking care of, of this subset um, of uh, projects developing data space components inside or under the umbrella of the Eclipse Foundation. So not a completely new kid in town. Um, and you will find, uh, thanks Alberto for sharing the link in the chat. Um, you will find a charger. So this is a very specific thing um, to build very specific uh, components uh, to support the erection of data spaces. Um, but I doubt that they will be um, doing everything in the future, because this is coming back to the picture that Danielle showed in the beginning. So we are of a different kind, and Eclipse Pound Foundation is of a very specific kind uh, to, to support the development of open source components. So yes, a new player on the table, and it's more fun to play with others. I mean, that's why we build data spaces, isn't it? Uh, playing with others is better than playing alone, and here we have a new player on the table, and that will be great uh, to have the support here. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, there is uh, in the chat another question that I see that was uh, post post during the Jason presentation, which I think was an answer. Uh, mm -hmm. Is from St uh, is from Stefan, and Stefan refers to the GaiaX Digital Cleaning House and asks, Are GaiaX Digital Cleaning House actually relying on the EBSI Trusted Issues API as issues governance? Um, off the top of my head, I don't know. Uh, I'd, have to, I'd have to check. Um, it's not the area I, I've not been doing the implementation of this, so I won't give you any more information. I believe it's the case, but I can't be I can't be certain. OK, th thank you, uh, Jason. And I think for now we are there's no many other question in the chat. Um, because the, the, the one address from uh, Constantinos has been answered promptly. So if there are no other questions, uh, I would like to remind you uh, once again that uh, their newsletter is, uh, is uh, you, you, can, you can subscribe to the DSSC newsletter to be always up to date with all the latest events, developments, and all, everything coming from our community. And uh, we will uh, we will see each other to the next um, at the next uh, Insight Series webinar, which take, which will take place in January. 
And on this occasion, I would like to take uh, to thank all the speakers here and uh, the CDAU, Gianfranco, thank you for sharing the link, uh, the QR code to subscribe to the newsletter again. Uh, so thank you, Jason, thank you, Gianfranco, Sebastian and Daniel to, uh, to, for the great presentation and thank you for our audience to stay until the end and see you soon to the next uh, DSC Insight Series appointment. Thank you, Anna. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all, folks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.